So I want to welcome everyone and thank you all for being here because without you, we would not be able to have this ceremony. And it's a very important ceremony. Uh, and I really value the fact that we can do it and do it together, both in the room and everyone online supporting us as well, supporting us and yourselves. It's a mutual support in our endeavor to maintain the precepts. That's what we're here to recommit ourselves to is to maintaining the ethical principles of our school. So uh, the vows you just did uh, were not to this person. This, the one called Bokshu was not who you were bowing to. You were bowing to the Kaishi, the, the one who gives the precepts. And um, so in this moment, that happens to be this person right here, but um, it's not this person right here. Uh, so what are the precepts? Let's see if we can get our pages in the right order. Hmm, interesting. Well, I've got, the printer didn't print properly. So I've got a page two and two page three. So I'm gonna wing part of it. Um, see if I can remember how I expressed it. The precepts are, are, living way. How are we in the world? They are a vehicle for us to be in the world. We're all connected, but we're all also individual. So how do we guide our behavior in the world? The precepts are here to offer us a way of guiding our behavior with each other. A tremendously valuable uh, way of doing that. They are um, also a way for us to refine our understanding of ourselves and our humanity, our collective situation. So they're, um, they're both uh, a structure for us to engage in the world and also a way to refine that engagement, to examine and refine it as we encounter each other and situations. There is a lot of unskillful behavior going on in the world right now. So the precepts are here to offer us a way to help the world along through more skillful means, more skillful behavior, interactions uh, that can transform our suffering into wisdom, our collective suffering and our individual suffering transform that into wisdom. And I had something else very fancy to say. And at the moment, I just don't remember what it was, but I think that will, that will do for now. Um, and um, so the structure of the ceremony that we do every month, we, we reacquaint ourselves and recommit ourselves to the precepts. And the structure of the ceremony for Zatsu in which we do that is that we first uh, atone. It is a ceremony of atonement or as our teachers have said to us all, at one moment. Uh, so we are acknowledging our connection to and our responsibility for all of the harm, all of the unskillful conduct that has existed throughout all space, all time. Not just each of us has, of course, our own little bit of that, uh, but we're taking on all of it and accepting responsibility for it, not pushing it away, not denying it, uh, or immunizing ourselves from any implication that we might be at fault. We're taking it on. That's the at one minute. 
that we're engaging with in this ceremony. So the first part is to do that. And then having done that, we take on the energies that can help us to recommit to the precepts, to recommit to an ethical life in this crazy world. So what are those energies? Well, the past seven Buddhas, the mythical Buddhas who preceded our original founding teacher, Shakyamuni, uh, we take on their energy. They were the pioneers of this tradition. And then Shakyamuni, the first human to realize his own suffering and his own role in creating his own suffering and the suffering of those around him. A tremendous discovery that, that he could actually take responsibility for his own suffering and guide others toward the alleviation of that suffering. What an amazing gift that we still feel and live today and that we're brought together here to live and experience and support each other today in this wonderful endeavor of relieving suffering. And as I often like to talk about, suffering is not just when a piano falls out of a window and hits you on the head, that definitely hurts. But suffering is what you do with that event. You're still around after the piano hits you. Start shaking your fist at the person who dropped it and going on for hours and hours about how terrible they are, that is the suffering. The pain ends, but the suffering continues until we allow ourselves to stop suffering. So after we take on these powerful energies, such as Shakyamuni, our original teacher, um, Manjushri, his teacher, the Bodhisattva of wisdom, Samantabhadra, the Bodhisattva of strength, the vow of determination, because boy, it takes a lot of strength to look at one's own suffering, to take responsibility for it, and to not spread it around. To say, this is my work. This is work for me to do for myself and for all beings at the same time. That takes a lot of strength, a lot of determination to do that year after year. And um, after Avalokiteshvara and Samantabhadra, we have, um, sorry, we have Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of compassion. Because the wisdom that says that the harm that has been done throughout all space and time is for me to, um, to connect with, to acknowledge my responsibility for, that wisdom is painful, isn't it? Can you imagine all the harm that's been done throughout all space and time? And to connect with that is deeply painful until we, we offer ourselves compassion. And that is the gift of Avalokiteshvara in this process. The strength of Samantabhadra that sustains us as we acknowledge our connection to all the harm. The wisdom of Manjushri who gives us that insight and the compassion of Avalokiteshvara who gives us the tenderness and the love that we need to survive what we finally understand. And uh, there are other avatars as well. So we connect with these energies so that we can then chant the four vows, which are really the highest expression of our intention in this practice. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. And there could be a whole talk in what does it mean to save? Who is saving whom? That is a whole world in itself. But we take on those energies so that we can advance toward our intention, however impossible it might seem. And uh, having chanted the four vows, then we have Tesha. And that's what's happening now. And the Tesha is always on one of the particular precepts, one of the 10 grave precepts. There are 16, the three pure precepts the three, I'm sorry, the three refuges, then the three pure precepts, and then the 10 grave precepts. 
So the Teisho is always on one of the 10 grave precepts. And my topic for tonight is the one grave precept uh, that very rarely is spoken about at these Buzatsu ceremonies. In fact, I cannot recall the last time that we had it at a Fuzatsu, and that is the precept of not misusing sex. This precept seems to be rather radioactive. Uh, people don't seem to talk about it much. Uh, I do want to mention and acknowledge that Fusho Hoshi recently gave a talk that I recommend you listen to in which she did touch on some of the aspects of this precept. She talked about a famous story about a monk who was sustained by an old lady and the old lady schemed with her niece to put her head in her, the old monk's lap and see what he'd do. And then she burned down his hut. It's a very dramatic story. I'm not gonna tell you that story. We've been over that recently. Uh, I have a different take on that story, uh, but I'll spare you that. <clears throat> so what I want to talk about is not misusing sex. And of course, in order to not misuse sex, we need to know what sex is. And if you think it's just penetration, uh, it's obviously not, it's far beyond that. Um, uh, and I will give an example of just how far I think beyond that this word is. Um, it's mysterious, actually, powerful, tremendous, and powerful energy, human energy. We would none of us be here. I assume none of us were the product of artificial insemination, let alone divine birth. So assuming those cases are not in the picture for any of us, we're all here because of sex. And that means it's of vital importance that we understand how to not misuse it, but not at the same time to turn it into something uh, that has to be avoided, not talked about, and um, an object of shame, because that is in fact very commonly what's done with sex. It's turned into an object of shame and guilt. And religions specialize in that uh, connection of shame and guilt with sex. And it's done tremendous harm in the world. That in fact is in my book, one of the primary ways that we have misused sex in our culture is to allow religion to hijack it and turn it into an object of shame and guilt. That has led to tremendous pain and also a tremendous amount of distorted behavior that has done enormous harm in the world. So if you do one thing, uh, <laughs> don't turn it into an object of guilt and shame because that will only make matters worse. The key is to integrate this essential part of humanity into a wholesome pattern that openly acknowledges its existence and importance and role in our lives without turning it into something distorted and harmful. That is a tall order at the moment. Many people don't even think that sex education should be offered in school. And that of course is the first way to learn how to not turn it into an object of shame and guilt, how to not have distorted attitudes about it, education. Many are opposed to it. That also is misusing sex to not talk about it, to not understand it, to not be educated about it is an abuse. And so uh, I make that appeal. And if you think that's just my opinion, the missing page uh, tells me, well, actually it's on the page that I have, one of the two I did get. There were 140,000 rapes in the United States in 2019, according to the FBI. That is, underreported. There are many that are not reported for many reasons, but 140,000, 12% of violent crimes in the country were rapes. I think that the guilt and shame that our culture has applied to sex has something to do with those. I'm not saying every single one is attributable to religion or that the guilt and shame can't be managed without having rape. I'm not saying that. But I think that our culture's very unwholesome attitude towards sex is implicated in the incredible numbers of sex crimes in our culture. So 
We do struggle to handle it. Should we condemn it or should we praise it? We really don't know. We have literature and art that praises it and we have religion that condemns it. Which is right? Is it any wonder that we don't know how to not misuse it and that it is so often misused? Um, Confucius, who was a contemporary of the Buddha wrote something that I thought was interesting. He said, I have never yet seen anyone whose desire to build up his moral power was as strong as his sexual desire. So here, Confucius, for all his wisdom, is making the fatal error of confusing moral power with putting sex in the proper role in our lives. The precepts, in my view, are an ethical teaching. They are a structure for living ethically. They are not about morality. I think the distinction between ethics and morality is critical when we want to look at the precepts. If we think that morality is the way to go, I would assert that that's a blunt instrument, to put it mildly. Morality is like a club you beat yourself or someone over the head with. The precepts are like a fine instrument, like a scalpel or a flute. They are something to work with in fine detail with a lot of subtlety and not something to just banish behavior and bash people over the heads with. So I think we're talking about ethics and it needs to be done skillfully, not aggressively. Uh, a more wise uh, teaching that might apply to this precept of not misusing sex comes in the song of the jewel mirror awareness, where it says, touching and turning away are both wrong, for it is like a massive fire. I think that expresses it perfectly. We can't ignore it, but we can't wallow in it either. We have to have a dynamic and balanced approach that has our eyes open to what's going on. So leaving aside the puritanical attitudes, what could be the misuse of sex? Uh, I'd like to take us very far from the conventional definition and mention something that happened quite recently. I'm sure most of you are aware of the massacre that occurred at Club Q in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, five people killed and at least 19 wounded in a rampage by a 22-year-old named Anderson Lee Aldrich. And at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida on June 12th, 2016, 49 people killed. 58 wounded by 29-year-old Omar Mateen. This is a textbook example of misusing sex as far as I'm concerned. It, these crimes were not random. These locations were not randomly chosen. They were chosen because people there were gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and um, all the other I's and Q's that go in that acronym. They were not chosen because there were people there. They were chosen because of who was there. And these are crimes that are definitely implicated in the misuse of sex. And they are also crimes that are implicated in the unwholesome attitude of our society toward sex. It's extremely serious. This is life and death stuff. And it wasn't, of course, just the misuse of sex in these crimes. They were killing, obviously. They were lying because they were apparently telling themselves, the assailants, that doing this would somehow make things better for themselves and the world. They thought that this would be a tonic, be a positive thing, somehow exorcise their demons, take out people they disagreed with. Who knows what was going on in their brains before they committed these crimes? But they were lying to themselves that they thought it would help. And of course, misusing sex, the third precept. Uh, they were stealing, the next one. 
because they rob these people of their lives and terrorize their communities, not just those who are wounded and killed, but those around them. The circles go on endlessly from this type of crime. It's, it's really stealing of the highest order or the lowest order. Uh, and after that, elevating the self and blaming others, of course, these people were conv convinced that they were um, avenging angels, people who were going to show those who were godless and inferior where their place was, those who were going to terrorize communities with whom they disagreed. And then, of course, the last one I can think of was indulging in anger. Tremendous anger must have been involved in these crimes. So you've got at least six of the 10 great precepts violated in these horrific criminal acts. And again, I don't want to imply that proper sex education and proper attitudes, whatever proper means, that sounds bad, doesn't it? I don't mean the proper as in prim and proper. That's not the kind of proper that I'm talking about. I mean the kind that is wholesome, aware, tolerant, and doesn't know, not knowing, thereby giving up fixed ideas about myself and the universe. This is ceasing from evil. That's what I'm talking about. So I bring up these mass shootings in almost every Dharma talk because they are so unbelievably heinous. And they're so common now that we're almost numb to them. Before one, we absorb one of them, there's another. Seems every day we see another headline about them. It is unbearable, the harm that is going on in the world. Just imagine if everyone was observing the precepts. Would these things go on? I don't think so. So the work that we're doing here is of tremendous importance. Never underestimate it. So leaving these terrible crimes aside, how do the less insane among us uphold the precept of not misusing sex? I think I can make it rather simple. There is no perfect definition, but I think we have to look at power relationships as a key to not misusing sex, because the key to me is consent. Consent is vital. So the questions we always have to ask ourselves is, is this person capable of giving consent? And then have they given it? There are whole classes of people who are incapable of giving consent to sexual activity. I'm a volunteer in the prisons at Sing Sing. The people who are incarcerated at Sing Sing are defined by law as not being capable of giving consent to sexual activity. And we sign documents saying that we understand that. Naturally, we understand it. So they cannot, they cannot consent legally to anything like that. Children, of course, are deemed to not be capable of consent. People with mental disabilities are not capable of informed consent. If someone cannot consent, it must not happen. Simple. And yet apparently not, because 140,000 rapes occurred in 2019. So someone's not getting the message that consent is absolutely mandatory for any sexual activity or sexual contact. So if you want to not misuse sex, get consent. There are other aspects of it that I could probably get into, but I think that's at least 80 to 90% of it. If people consent, and are conscious and willing to work together in a mutually respectful way in their intimate contact, no problemo. But it's much easier said than done, isn't it? The world doesn't work the way words come out of our mouths. It's much more complex and that is why we have the precepts. We need them to guide and structure our behavior in our interactions with each other. So uh, we have some commentaries on this precept. I'll just say, first of all, that Bodhidharma, uh, his commentary is, 
Self-nature is subtle and mysterious. In the realm of the ungilded dharma, not creating a veneer of attachment is called the precept of not misusing sex. Uh, it's quite a mouthful, really. The ungilded dharma. I think that's, um, for me, that feels very remote from the point. <laughs> Far be it for me to critique Bodhidharma of all people, but uh, it is not helping me operationally work with this precept. So maybe you get more out of this ungilded Dharma than I do. Maybe I'm too ungilded to get anything out of it. I don't know. Then we have Dogen. <clears throat> the three wheels are pure and clear. When you have nothing to desire, you follow the way of all Buddhas. In case you're wondering what the three wheels are, Aitken Roshi uh, says that they are the actor, the thing acted upon, and the action. Rather abstract, isn't it? But I think you can connect the dots. Uh, but here I have something more to say. When you have nothing to desire, you follow the way of all Buddhas. Don't assume that this comment is about not having desire. That is much too gross an interpretation, in my opinion. There's more to chew on with not having a desire. What arises spontaneously in each of us? Is it the name? Is it the word that we use to define something? Or is it in fact our very lives beyond definition, beyond words, beyond labels such as desire? How can we be utterly spontaneous and free and yet still be guided by these principles? That's the art that we're here to practice. Zen Peacemakers has this distillation of the precept, encountering all creations with respect and dignity. That I can sign on to. That hits it right on the head. Encountering all creations with respect and dignity, that really applies to the widest possible definition of sex. But then it says, this is a precept of chaste conduct. Well, the word chaste, I think that's a little loaded. So I'm not sure I can, I can use that word in this context. I think that's a bit antiquated in my book. Um, so I'd like to close this talk uh, with a quote from my teachers, 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 teacher, Koryu Osaka Roshi, who said on the precepts, our responsibilities do not arise from externally established rules or regulation, but rather such feelings as are supposed to be a spontaneous expression of our inner state. When you become aware of what life is, of who you are, as a natural result, you become much more aware of other people. You become very naturally compassionate, concerned about other people so that without being told or being regulated externally, you can quite well accomplish the things you wish to do. Those are the vows. And if there is any responsibility as such, that is to become aware of what life is. <laughs>